Um, we, we usually try to look at basic issues, fundamentals, particularly now that we're beginning the cycle of uh, reading the Torah again. So let's look at a subject that I do not believe we've, we've examined here before. That's the question of brachas, blessings, blessings. The idea of a bracha, what it means, the idea of a curse, what that means, and why Jewish life is built around the practice of expre- expressing virtually everything that we do accompanied by a, by a bracha. Brachot. What, what is the meaning of the, this area? try to show how fundamental it is and how it reaches into all avenues of, of Torah understanding and of Jewish life. Perhaps we, we, we can start like this. You know that a fundamental question would be this. <clears throat> you know, if you know very little about Judaism, you know that every, everything we do is accompanied by a blessing. I, I presume we presume you know that. You don't have to be very Jewish to know that everything we do, from being born, <coughs> from virtually from the moment of birth, <coughs> in fact, here's a blessing you're supposed to make on the birth of a child. Mother makes one blessing, father makes another blessing, depends if it's a boy or a girl. All the way through Bruce Miller, circumcision, pigeon up I mean, it doesn't stop from birth until death. There's also blessings. From the moment you wake up in the morning till the moment you go to sleep at night, we have a blessing on virtually everything. We have a blessing on using the bathroom. Using the bathroom. It's not a particularly elevated spiritual experience. No. And yet, the Jewish response is, Jewish approach is, you use the bathroom, your body functions, right, which is intrinsically humiliating. In fact, the, the, the nature of the blessing is, it's interesting, the blessing we make on using the bathroom is mafli la'asot. Mafli la'asot, that means who does wondrously. What is the wondrous, particularly the word mafli in Hebrew is the same, the word pele means a miracle. In fact, the same letters as the word aleph, as the letter aleph, which always means the connection between physical and spiritual. It's the paradoxical connection of physical and spiritual. You wax that eloquent about your body functioning. In fact, in fact, in the same blessing, we say, the blessing is, we say, rofechol basar. Who heals all flesh? The word is the word used for healing of an illness. There's even an element of illness in the fact that the body has to work the way it does in, in excretion. What's the illness? What's the illness? Spiritually, the illness element is that Adam, when he was created, did not need those functions. That means, at a high enough spiritual level, he ate food that was perfectly pure, it was perfectly absorbed. There was no element of separation and excretion. It's the situation of sin, of deficiency in the world, that leads the body to have its humiliating, containing its own excrement, and needing to go through the process of separation. Therefore, there is a healing, so to speak, of a type of a spiritual illness that led to the situation as it is now. But despite that, despite that, that notwithstanding, we make a blessing on that. Is there any other religion in the world that actually waxes poetic and, and spiritual about using the bathroom? It's hard to imagine. So, we make blessings on everything. Every food you eat, there's no, you have virtually no food that you eat, certainly no food that has a taste that you don't make a blessing on. There's virtually nothing in Jewish living that you don't make a blessing on. One of the perplexing questions, first of all, the basic question is why? Why do you have to make a blessing on everything? And perhaps even more difficult is the fact that the Torah itself does not mandate this. You know that according to the Torah, there are virtually no blessings required. In fact, before the men of the Great Assembly, the, the Anshayk Nessus Agdela, which you're talking 2,400 years ago, let's say, the generation that ended prophecy, before that generation, Jews did not make blessings. Why? Because all the blessings we have, all the brachas that we have of rabbinic origin, rabbinic coinage, again, the sages um, uh, uh, composed the blessings. The Gemara says, Heim Tiknu, Kedushas, Brachas, Havdolos, Tulus, all our prayers and, and uh, Blessings, even our prayers, incidentally, are comprised of blessings. Prayer, prayer. The ikka, the, 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 the essence of tefillah, is to ask Hashem for your needs. To ask God for your needs. And even that we express as 19 blessings, in which are couched the request for our needs. What's the meaning of that? Why is it like that? But essentially, the Torah only mandates two blessings. 
the sages added all the other hundreds of blessings that we use. Which are the two blessings that the Torah itself mandates? With benching after bread, eating bread and saying grace after meals, because I'm Muslim, and the other one is learning Torah. Learning Torah. Those are the two blessings that the Torah mandates. The verses for them eating blessing after bread, because the Torah says Vachalta Vasavata Ugarachma. You should eat and be satisfied. It means you have to be full and bless Hashem. Allah Hashem on the good land that gives the that gives the food. So the Torah itself mandates a blessing after the, the essence of eating, which is bread, and therefore we make a blessing, four blessings as it happens. I'm not going to go into the history of that, but the, 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 the benching is Torah mandated. Also, learning Torah is a blessing that incidentally, just like eating bread, men and women should make when you wake up in the morning, be having interrupted your learning by sleep. The custom is to, the halacha is to make blessings on the learning of Torah. Not only when you get called up to read the Torah, but also when you wake up in the morning. And men and women should both make those blessings. Even though the essence of a woman's learning is different than the essence of a man's learning, nevertheless, both men and women have to learn Torah, and therefore you make a blessing. Why, incidentally, do you make a blessing after eating, but before learning? Why, why do we make a blessing on bread? After eating. But in Torah, you make it before the learning. And the basic answer is that the blessing here is a blessing of satiety. It's a blessing of fullness. It's an appreciation of fullness, in a sense. And of course, when you eat bread, you, full only, you feel full only when you've eaten the bread. In Torah, the more you learn, the hungrier you become. In Torah, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, and the hungrier you become to know. And therefore, the only time you can feel relatively satisfied with your learning is before you start. But after you start learning, it's a, it's a nightmare. And so, we make blessings after eating, but before learning. Those are the two blessings both of which are a form of sustenance. Bread is that which sustains the body, and Torah is that which is also called bread in the sense it sustains the mind, the spirit, the neshama. Torah and Mishra are like bread and water. And therefore, these two areas of sustenance, spiritual and physical, we make blessings. But all the rest, blessings on smelling spices, blessings on the first blossoms in spring, blessings on seeing an incredibly beautiful person, seeing a misshapen person, Seeing a wise individual, seeing a non-Jewish sage, seeing a Jewish sage, seeing a king, seeing a Jewish king, a non-Jewish king. You name it. I mean, there's blessings on <coughs> lightning, thunder. Look in the city, you'll find a... Uh, in fact, there's a, even a derivation that Gemara says that the verse that says, Ma Hashem Alokecha what does Hashem want from you? The Hebrew word Ma uh, can be expressed, nuanced as Mea, which means a hundred. And from this, the Gemara learns that you should make a hundred blessings every day. A hundred blessings every day, ideally. A man, certainly. So, and it's not difficult to make a hundred blessings a day. There's 19 in each filler, yeah, at least, at least three of those a day. Certainly for a man who governs all three. And then many other blessings in, in, in addition. You eat, you use a bathroom, etc. Certain obligatory blessings, a whole list of them in the morning for shoes, for having a belt to keep your trousers up for something that covers your head, for the fact that there's a ground to walk on, for the fact that the ground covers the waters and doesn't sink. Many blessings. Now, the question, the fundamental question is, why were these blessings instituted by the men of the Great Assembly and they were not necessary before? If blessings, again, let's get this clear, if blessings, if brachas are so fundamental, so fundamental that virtually nothing we do, whether it's a mitzvah or something that we enjoy, that we yeah, attach a blessing to it, how did Jews live without a siddur? Yeah, again, look in the Siddur, Hebrew, yeah, Siddur, book of the liturgy, book of Jewish prayers. You find the book is, the, the whole Siddur is virtually bread blessings. Virtually the whole Siddur is brachas, whether it's the Tfilas, whether it's the brachas themselves. Before Sheikh Nessus and God, before the men of the Great Assembly, Jews didn't make blessings. What the Siddur must have been very thin. Very thin. People expressed their needs in their own personal words, and they never made blessings. Why are they this fundamental? As fun, is a basic question. Why are blessings, brachas, are this fundamental when they're not necessary before? And somehow afterwards they became so necessary that we don't move without making a blessing on that activity. Why is that? Let's try to delve into the nature of a blessing and why they are so fundamental in Jewish thinking. They're not just sort of uh, ancillary components. They are fundamental in the concept of bracha. The concept of putting one's head into the world of blessing, of bracha, what it means spiritually. It's an absolutely essential element of Jewish, of, of the Jewish spiritual path. So let's see if we can try and study that this evening and see if we can understand and answer some of the questions we began with. The whole thing's peculiar. What do you mean, blessed? Yeah. 
Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you. He, you blessing him? What does that mean in the first place? What is exactly the nature of blessing? Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are, if you really want to be very English about it, is blessed art thou. You blessing him? What does that mean exactly? Uh, let's try to understand this. First of all, what's the nature of a brach itself? What is the nature of brach? What does that mean spiritually? The Jewish concept of brach, of blessing, means increase. It means multiplicity, multiplication. And let's get that clear. What's called tesefes veribui. That's the concept. Addition and multiplicity, <coughs> multiplication. Many ways to approach this. Perhaps, this. perhaps one way to approach it is like this. The Medrash says that the world was created. The Torah begins with a base. Bet. Bereshit, right? Bereshit. The Medrash says, why was that letter chosen to begin the Torah? The whole chronology of the creation, the history of the world, begins with the base, the second letter of the alphabet. Why? The Medrash says that when Hashem wanted to create the world, all the letters appealed. Again, he talked to him very deep things here. It's expressed in childlike, with childlike simplicity. Anthropomorphic, childlike simplicity. To understand what's going on here in depth, in the depth, you know what the Hebrew letters are. The Hebrew letters actually are the connections between the mystical dimensions. You know, there are ten mystical elements or dimensions that build the world. The 22 lines that connect them, each represents a letter. A letter of the alphabet in Hebrew, and each letter of the alphabet is an interaction between these ten mystical emanations. On the contrary, if you know what, if you know what the letters mean, if you know what those ten emanations are, then you know what each letter is actually saying. Right? You can actually understand what each letter means. So, if you know what each of these things is, each letter has a specific meaning. Each letter is not just a way of constructing words. Each letter in Hebrew is a specific interaction between two of, the, of these ten emanations. Hebrew is an ultimately scientific and precise language. Every word means what it says because it's constructed of those elements. Not like in another language. Other languages are conventions. When you utter a sound in another language, it's a convention. By a convention, I say a word that means this thing, you know it means this thing. In Hebrew, the word actually is that thing. And I think we've explained before the notion that in Hebrew, the word for a word and the word for a thing is the same. We'd have to return to this idea. In Hebrew, the word for a word is davar, and the word for anything is davar. Why? In other languages, you don't have that, that overlap. In English, a word is a sound that denotes something, and a thing is a thing. In Hebrew, the word for a word and the word for a thing are the same word. Why? What's the connection between things in the world and words that describe them? And the answer is, in other languages, words describe things. In Hebrew, the word is the thing. There's a divine word that is spoken which manifests as the thing. Or conversely, the thing speaks its word. The world should be a dialogue. You should be listening to all objects because each object on earth speaks out its message. <laughs> Try and come back to this. But... The, the letters of the alphabet, each one, each Hebrew letter, is a, is a spiritual force. It's creative spiritual energy. And therefore the world is built of these letters. Now the concept is, which is the letter that begins the Torah? Because that must be fundamental. It means that the world itself, the nature of the world, will be expressed in the first letter. Again, we've shared together the concept that in Hebrew, in Torah, all concepts, all areas, all systems, unfold from their root. The word Bereshis, the first word of the Torah, contains the whole Torah. The rest is an unfolding, an exposition. Yes, a revelation of what's there in the first word. The first word in the Torah spiritually is the word Anoichi. I am, I am. Which is the word of spiritual origin, not chronological origin. That happens to begin with an Aleph, obviously. The whole Torah is contained in the word Anoichi. It unfolds from there. So if you're looking at chronology, you're looking at time, beginning with the word Bereshis, and it begins with a base, somehow that letter must be fundamental to the nature of the creation and what will all unfold from that letter. So the matter says that all the letters vied to be the one that the world should be created with. Think deeply into the meaning of this. So each letter came and begged to be the one that the Torah should start with. <coughs> and each letter was rejected in turn, going from the top, the final letter, all the way back. Fascinating Medrash. When, when the, the second last letter, namely the second letter of the alphabet arrived, the letter base, and appealed to be the one that, that the world should be found, founded on. So Hashem said, I choose you because you stand for bracha, blessing. That means the nature of creation is fundamentally bracha, which means an increase, that which is a unit or a nucleus or a kernel that gives more, that is more. 
What you see is not what you get. What you see is only the root that is essentially a root that, 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 that explodes into more than the root. The letter that says that is base. The Aleph, incidentally, which is the ultimate spiritual letter, was not used, wasn't even considered. The Aleph wasn't considered because, <coughs> you see, had the world been created with an Aleph, there would be no place for, for blessing. Because in Aleph, all things are one. They are already yeah, in the form of perfection. There's no place for a thing to increase and expand and, and, and multiply. We have to discuss that more. The Aleph is the spiritual root, of course. That's why the Torah, which, is its, which in its phase of perfection, begins with an Aleph. But the world, which is that which approximates its perfection, moves towards, all, always moves towards its perfection, that begins with the base. And in fact, that's what happened. The world was created with the base. We learn here that the letter bet, the letter, the letter, yeah, the second letter, which means two, Aleph is one, and the second letter is two. Two-ness, the concept of two, is the concept of Brahma. One of the Rishonim, one of the great, famous, early Torah authorities, says he has difficulty with this message. Why? Because there are many bad words that will begin a base as well. If you look in Hebrew, you'll find there are many words that, that denote weeping and uh, destruction and okay, all sorts of words in Hebrew. They are quite the opposite of blessing, begin with a base. So he says, what do you mean that bet in Hebrew is the letter of bracha? There's all sorts of bad words because the word bracha begins with a bet. There's all sorts of bad words that begin with a base. What's the meaning of this? So the Maral says in the characteristic, I mean, it's one of those places where you hear the Maral argue with the Rishonim. It's a remarkable thing and he uses very strong language. The Maral says that Ibn Ezra did not go down to the root of... Yeah, that they never, he never plumbed the depth of the meaning of the sage. I mean, just to say that, but to be able to say that about the Ibn Ezra, you, you need to be the Maral, but that's what he says. And, what, and the concept is this. Not that the word bracha begins with a bet, and therefore, base itself is the concept of bracha. In fact, he points out very, very potently that the word bracha in Hebrew, the word, the root, baruch in Hebrew, is 2, 20, and 200. It's, yet yeah, base, resh, and chaf in Hebrew are 2, 20, and 200. In other words, all multiplicities, all expressions of two-ness in the alphabet are contained in the word blessing. It isn't only two. It isn't only that the word begins with a bet, which means two. The word itself is all dimensions of two-ness. You know, in Hebrew you have only units, tens, and hundreds. That's all there are. That's all there is. Because a thousand, Elef, a thousand is the highest number of the decimal system that's expressed in the alphabet. Elef is the same as Aleph. You go back to the beginning. There's no higher number in the Hebrew. In Hebrew, yeah, there's, no, he, there's no, no Torah word that expresses more than a thousand. The word Revava in Hebrew, which is often translated as tens of thousands, or ten, it just means much. Revava means much. But the highest specific number is Elef. So you have, in the, two, in the units, the tens and the hundreds, you have two. You know, of course, the word Baruch also means the knee. You know that. You know that. Barach in Hebrew is also a knee. Why? That's your homework. That, that you can think about. If you can, after what we've said already, it should be clear. A, a simple interpretation, which is a, which is a, a, a drasha, a drush, is that Baruch Atah means we bend the knee before you. Yeah, we acknowledge that it's you, that's what a blessing means, what are the meanings of a bracha, and, and in, yeah. but there's, there's much deeper, Berach means, I'm sure you'll be able to work it out. The point is that the word bracha is not that it happens to begin with a base. Tunus is the concept of blessing. Two, twenty, two hundred, why is that? Because the concept of bracha in Jewish terms, again, we have to get non-Jewish and secular concepts out of our head. In Judaism, in Torah, bracha means there's something that, become, that can become more. That's the way to see it is like this. What's the notion of a claw of a curse? What's our concept of a curse? In secular terms, or in non-Jewish terms, a curse is something that disintegrates, that, 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 uh, that um, becomes contaminated, or that, that rots, decomposes, the concept of curse in Jewish terms is something that is only what it is and is not more. And let's put our heads into this. Our concept of a curse is that the thing is, stay carefully with me, it's fundamental. You see, we have here to know the subject and to unlearn the secular notion. Not, not easy. The concept of a curse in Jewish terms is that the thing is pegged as what it is and can no longer increase. 
Perhaps you remember when we discussed the concept of astrology. You may remember that we said that the Jewish punishment for astrology, yes, that means the Torah says that if you go to an astrologer, not if you get astrological information, that's, uh, that could be, but if you seek astrological information, the punishment is that you can no longer change it. Because the thing becomes fixed. You put yourself into the fixed system, you put yourself into the mechanics, which a Jew should not do, in Muslim Israel, we are above the mechanical system, then you live on an infinite plane. But you put yourself into the mechanical system, you want to be part of the system, you believe it governs you, then you become fixed by the system itself. Curse in Jewish terms is that the thing is fixed and finite, it cannot no longer move. At the risk of offending one half of the audience, I'll take the risk. The word female in Hebrew <laughs> the word female has an aspect of curse. The word nikkeva in Hebrew, and said as well. Let, 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 before, perhaps we, we need to start this way, just to prevent things being violently hurled in this direction. You know that base is the letter of brocha, which is the woman's letter. Let's get that clear. Male and female have curse and blessing. Huh? The male curse, the male blessing is that he's the source of energy. Yeah? He produces energy, that's why Hashem is always referred to as male. That multipotential infinite source. The curse of maleness is that without a woman to pick up that multipotential source and give a tangible reality in the world, it's nothing. The female blessing is that she can give tangible reality to something, give it concrete, what's called chomer, give it material. The female curse is that in giving it a tangible reality, she tends to the pole of making a thing so concrete that it's frozen and has only one non, non-expandable, non-flexible, yeah, dead shape. The word nekeva in Hebrew, which means female, literally means to fix and make finite. It, like it says, Fix your wages and I'll pay you. Give me a figure. That's a female function. Yeah? It means, you see the tension here. If a person says, quote a figure and I'll pay you. Any figure. That's an amazing offer. Somebody says to you, name a figure and I'll pay it to you. The mind boggles. I mean, you could say more and more, but until you've said something, you get nothing. The female function is having to say a specific figure, and when you say the specific number, what happens at that moment is blessing and curse. The blessing is you get that amount, of, you get that amount. it's unbelievable. The curse is not one penny more. You, whatever figure you said, you, do you understand what's happening here? The female function is to give tangible, specific, finite, ultimately limited expression to all the potentialities that could have been. The blessing is you have something real in the world. In the biological world. In the world of mammals. The male gives seed by the billion. The woman gives only one at a time. Billions get lost and destroyed. And she decides which one to express and only that one. That's the curse. All the rest die. The blessing is a child is born. A child is born. Something is real in the world. And of course the skill of being female is to give that thing tangible reality only enough to express it in the world but not to freeze it and kill it. That child must not be something that is static. It must grow and grow and grow until it has to tear itself away in pain and danger. But it does and it continues growing. She has to give tangible reality to the spark so it becomes a flame but an ever-growing flame. But that's the tension. That's the difficulty. Curse means pegging a thing as finite and not allowing it to be that spark that becomes a flame. That's the danger of the female side of reality. You know, the word for human, the word for human is Adam. Adam. The word means multiplicity. You know that? For example, here's an example. The Gemara says the word Adam is the same root as Adama, which is the earth. What is the point of the earth? That what you put in it grows and gives more. Another nuance of the word is Adamel Elyon. I will be like that which is above, like Hashem, which is ultimately multipotential. The word Adam, incidentally, if you rearrange the letters, it spells Ma'od, very. It adds up to 45, deeply significant number Kabbalistically. And the value of that 45 is Ma'od. Ma'od means very. Whatever you have, it's more. That's what very means. In the fact, the Torah says on every day that the world was created, the passion we're reading now, each day that was created, Hashem looked at the world and said, Kitov, it was good, virtually each day. When it came to Friday, when man was created, he said, Toiv Ma'od. 
man is represented not only that the letters of other Mamoid, but man is, human being, is that which is very. The rest of the world is not like that. Everything else on earth is simply what it is. The Maral explains this beautifully. You know the word for an animal in Hebrew? The two most closely related entities in the universe, in the biological world, are humans and animals. The difference between a human and an animal, the word an animal in Hebrew is called behema. Behema in Hebrew literally spells ba ma. It's 45. It's what. Ma in Hebrew not only means 45, but means what is it. It's whatness is in it. The essence of an animal is in the animal. From the tip of his nose to the end of his tail, what you see is what you get. An animal isn't more than that. He doesn't extend beyond the boundaries of his <coughs> physical structure. But the human being is all void. The, what you look at when you see, what you see when you look at a human being is only the tip of the eye. All you see in the human being is the part that fits into his body. But the majority of the human being extends beyond his body. He is more than what you see. If he's human, if he's an animal, then he's constrained within his body. A curse is to be limited to what you see in the finite world. But beyond what you can see, you know what the Gemara says? A bracha can only be found in that which is hidden from the eye. And a bracha metsuyo elevadavra has some women eye. Blessing can only inhere in something that is hidden from the eye. Why? We're not only talking here about the thing called eye and horror, which is a deep issue called the evil eye. You know what's the essence of the evil eye? What is the essence of the evil eye? What does it mean? The essence is that when a thing is seen, it's fixed. This is why a child, incidentally, is conceived and born inwardly. It can grow and expand where it cannot be seen. When a thing is seen, then to change it would be miraculous. If a thing is not seen, the Gemara says if you're walking down to measure your wealth, let's say you're walking down to your grain store, on the way you can pray that it should be more than what it is. You can ask that it should be increased. Why? Because if no one sees, it could happen. But once you start to measure, you can't ask for that anymore. Now you're asking for that which has been revealed, revealed to the eye, brought out into the world, it's now finite, you want that to increase, that takes a miracle. That takes a miracle. Miraculously that could happen. But in the world of bracha, which is not miraculous, it is only an increase because it's not seen. Not because, you, <laughs> not because there's some reason that you shouldn't see the blessing. Hashem doesn't want you to see it. We're not talking about that. We're talking about that which is seen cannot be blessed. Is the point clear? Because once it's seen, it's been revealed as what it is. It can't be more than what it is. But in the spiritual world, in the hidden world, the, the unrevealed world, there's no constraint. The thing could be more than what it is. It could be my age. That's why blessing, bracha means becoming two, where there was only one before. You know, what we really mean is taking one and making more than one. But two, the concept of two, is the minimal quantity that is plural. In essence, when you say two, you've said multiplicity, you've said increase. Incidentally, that's all contained within the woman, both of these dualities. You know that all duplicated parts of the body are feminine, except for one, which I'm not even going to know. But all organs in the body that are duplicated, arms, legs, eyes, the, ver- the whole human body is doubled. And except for very few things, the, the circum- the, what's called the circumcision, the bris of the tongue, the bris of the bris itself. Those are the womb, those are central organs. But all other parts of the body, virtually, all life-sustaining organs, are, are in some way duplicated. All duplicated parts of the body in Hebrew take the feminine. Because that's the concept of bringing one into tunis with its problems and with its bracha, that's the female. The Hebrew word yad is not feminine in any way, but it always takes the female. It always takes the feminine. Regal. Regal raglai. If anything's male, that is. But no, we don't say we do. It always takes the feminine. The place of duplication, where the seed reproduces itself yeah, and comes into expression of of duality or multiplicity. Brocha, that's what the womb brings to the world. How does she do it? In that paradoxical exercise of giving a tangible representation, which now limits it in the finite world, and yet expresses more than was there before. That's the concept of brocha. Brocha is that there's more than there was before, and that's, what, that's how the world is created. You know, incidentally, the word ma'od in Hebrew, which means very, has another meaning. It also means money. Ma'od, the letters of Adam, meaning much, or more than, or many, or very, that word also means money. With all your money, all your possessions. Because money is essentially the tool of multiplicity in the system of economics. 
Uh, up to now we discussed the system of biology or the system of creation in general. But in the system that the Torah recognizes as an economic system, there's a tool called money. Money's not just a convention. Money's got a deep Torah root called kesef. I mean, so the gold is not the same. Gold in Torah is that which is bought. Money is that which buys. The technical term for money, gold is the, is the standard. That's what's bought. When, you, when, you're discussing in halachid, when you're discussing a deal of currencies, which currency acquires and which is acquired, it's very important to know. Because in the laws of interest, for example, you have to know which one is acquiring and which one is the value. Where's the standard? Gold happens to be, without going into the capitalistic reasons, gold happens to be the standard. That which buys, yeah, the word kesef in Hebrew means to desire, to want to get to another place. The Torah word for money is moed, very, because it's a tool of multiplicity. Money is nothing in itself. Money is nothing, what can you do with money? You can't eat it. It doesn't have intrinsic value. Its value lies in what it can be translated into, which is the nature of the whole economic system. And therefore it's called much. It's called moed, very. Bracha means that the thing becomes more. Uh, let's take one step further. What does Baruch mean? Blessed. Baruch Ata Hashem. You, God, are blessed. Nebuchadnezzar Chaim explains like this. It's a, it's a travesty to think that it means I'm giving him a blessing. What Baruch means is, Hashem, you are the source of this blessing. Baruch, ta- Baruch means, the, there's one thing we, we walk out of here this evening knowing, it should be this. When you make a bracha, when you make a blessing, what are you doing is you're identifying the source of the multiplicity that is this blessing. When you take an apple in your hand and you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, you Hashem, yeah, Bore Priyates, you are the creator of this fruit of the tree. You're not giving him a blessing for having done this like you you know, well done, and you, you. What you mean is, what you mean is that this, you Hashem are the source of this apple. The deep meaning is, you Hashem are the source of the multiplicity, that means you brought the thing into existence from a seed, or from a nothingness, there's been a multiplicity. The whole idea of a fruit is it. The well, idea of a fruit is that it's a source of infinite multiplicity. That's what a seed is, what a fruit is. Why is a fruit that, why is a fruit that which has seeds? Why in the same place on the plant is the fruit and the seed? Because the tachlis, the end product, the part that is created for your use, which is where the sweetness is, is also the secret of infinity. Because in a remarkable thing, you know, I can learn from a fruit. A fruit is a place that is the final product that's edible, the tree was created for that, to give you that. That's incidentally why in blessings, you know that the two kinds of blessings we make, we make boire tree, yet blessed is he who is the creator of the fruit of the tree, the ground, whatever it is, and the other blessings that do not have the word boire in, like for example, yeah, for example, shakol nia bidvaroi, Everything is by your word. When you drink a glass of water, you eat an egg, or you eat meat, or cheese, or milk, anything like that, you say, eat meat, for example. You say, shakol near bidvar. You don't mention the word creation. Why? The deep meaning is that all the blessings that have the word creation in are referring to things that were created for your use. Their creation is for you, so when you use it, you make that blessing. Meat was not created for your use. But you're not supposed to eat meat. Eating meat is a, is, a, is a fault line. Only because of the flood and because human beings saved the animals after having condemned them to death. The animals owe their existence now to human beings because they were saved in the flood. And as a fallen state, we eat meat. But what's not originally created to be eaten and once again in the future will not be eaten by human beings. The plant world was created for human use to be eaten. So we say, boy repria, it's boy repria, But shakol ni bitvaru, we don't say it was created for my use, animal world. It was not originally. But in this experience called fruit, both things come together. You know the wording of the blessing for a fruit that is sweet. You know that the blessings are made on the taste. You know that? It's called birkas hanen, in pleasure. You make a blessing on the pleasure of the food, even though the subject matter is the sustenance. You hear that paradox? When you make a blessing on an apple, when you finish eating, you say, Baruch chei ha'ilomim. Blessed is the one who gives life to the world. Why? To the world. Because this food has sustained you, given you life. But you only make it that blessing if it tastes good. If the food has no taste, you make no blessing. You know that? If you drink a glass of water, when you're not thirsty, you make no blessing. No blessing, not a word. Drink it down. 
If you're drinking water because the doctor told you to drink it, or you need to swallow a tablet, and you're not thirsty, why? Because water has no taste. When you're thirsty, water is delicious. And so you make a blessing on the pleasure of the water. It's very pleasurable when you're thirsty. But when you're not thirsty, there's no taste at all, no blessing. So the blessing is fixed on the pleasure of the experience, and the wording is not the pleasure, the wording is who sustains me. Why? There's a deep connection. It's not to go into now in detail, but the deep connection is that the feeling of pleasure is always a heightened sense of being alive. Think about it. Pleasure. The stimulation of nerve endings that gives a sensation of pleasure. It's a heightened sense of being at that moment. And that's where the two flow together. So let's try and put it together. The concept of bracha means ribui, teisefes, there's more. You can look this all up in the Nebuchadnezzar Chaim, he speaks of that very plainly. And Baruch Atah Hashem, you Hashem are the source of this blessing. And you identify Hashem as the source. The Kabbalistic mechanism is that when you identify Hashem as the source, He becomes more of the source. Nebuchadnezzar Chaim says, when you point out that Hashem is the source of this particular thing, an energy comes down that gives more force and energy to that thing. And it, it, it undergoes an increase. It undergoes a process of Tosefes Veribo. You bring down Shefa, what's called in the in the deeper writing, Shafa means a flow of, of energy, a flow of input into that thing. That's what the Brocha does. It's not only an appreciation, it's by no means it's only a, an expression of facts. It has that connotation too. But it's much more than that. It's an identifying of the source in such a way that that source brings more. That's why the Kabbalistic tool was always to intend in the blessings the specific nuances of the divine names. Because then you would be appealing and going directly to the particular source of this thing, and bringing down the particular energy into this thing. Not just meaning a general problem. Today we, we hardly do that because it's a tremendously developed skill, and to maintain focus, difficult enough just to remember who, who, to whom you are saying this blessing at all, let alone exactly which nuances of Kabbalistic worlds and names. So it's virtually a lost art. But specifically it was to go to the specific area, as it were, the particular creative source and bring down the effect from that source that's what a blessing is you have to understand that saying a bracha in the world is not just mumbling a, a, a thank you that would be enough but it's much more than that it's connecting to the source of creation here when a Jew makes a blessing you're connecting to the source you're identifying the source and bringing it to expression in the world not just saying thank you that's what it is that's why children should be taught to make blessings even if they're too young to really speak out the whole thing but how do you teach a child to make a, to bench after meals? To make blessings after meals? It's a long, it's a long thing. A little child. The child should be made to say, thanks Hashem. Thank you Hashem. Or, the Gemara says, when little children were too young to, to, to make brachas, they used to teach them to say, Brich Rachmana, Mara Dahai Peter. Blessed is the, the merciful one, master of this bread. That's all. As your child gets up and he's too young or too impatient to make a bracha, to bench, say to him, say, Brich Rachmana, you Hashem are blessed, yeah, master of this bread, and thanks Ima for the meal. Thanks also, not only Hashem, his mother also had a, had a hand. Child is to say thanks to both of those. <coughs> Let's try and answer the questions we began with and see if we can put it together. Why is everything that we do now a blessing? I think you can see. Because everything, yeah, you have to identify the source, acknowledge the source, focus on the source, and bring it down. Why did Jews not make blessings before? Uh, let's put our heads into this for a few moments. Without going into too much detail, when the world was created, each object, again, focus with me, each object on earth was created by being spoken into existence. How did Hashem create the world? Apart from the fact that it says He did things with His hands, whatever that means. But the Torah expression of creation is by Yomer Elohim, Hashem said, so the novice thinks, the person who is uninitiated in Torah thinks it means that God gave an instruction. He said, let there be light. Who was he speaking to? I don't know. I guess the department that makes light. You know, with the, uh, It's not the concept. The concept is when he said, let there be light, the mechanism spiritually was, he said the word light. He said the word or. And his word, davar, crystallized, condensed, concretized into the thing, davar, light. Again. The problem is, we don't understand this because our words describe things. Our words are not things. Our words talk about things. But real words in Torah, words of creation, are the things. The way the world was created wasn't by speaking about things and then someone following an instruction. 
the way the world was created was he said the words that are the things. In his world of creation, the word and the thing are the same thing. That's why the same word applies to them. Dabba. The consequence is that the world speaks its message. Do you know what an apple should be? An apple should be an apple, and it should be a word of Hashem speaking to you of its creation. When the world was formed originally, and this was the language, we refer now to that kind of language as prophecy. The Rambam said that when a prophet spoke, and this language was used, you didn't hear a person speaking, you experienced what he said. There was no way of doubting such a person. Today we talk about things, and I speak about the thing, and you hear, you actually don't even hear what I'm saying. You're so busy thinking of what you think I mean, and most people aren't even busy with that. They're so busy thinking what they're going to answer, even though they haven't taken the time to think what they think the person means in the first place, they can argue. And you know, it's even more humiliating, that's how we think to ourselves. You know that? That's how we talk to ourselves. How do we think? Do we know things? No. We have a conversation with ourselves. And we don't even listen. <laughs> we say something to ourselves, and before we've even understood what we've met, we're already thinking what we're going to answer. We have a conversation. There's a pathetically low-level talk show that's going on in here with, 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 with commentary. We don't know things anymore. We live in a world that is so full of, of, of communications being spewed, out, being spewed out meaninglessly. At best, meaningless. And usually lies. But that's not how speech was. When the world was created, words <laughs> didn't talk about things. They were the things. And that's how creation progressed. If you were born in a world like that, you could never misunderstand anyone. Today, the only way you can hope to understand someone is when you don't have to speak. Then two people could understand. Two people can understand each other without words, they understand each other. If they have to start explaining, it's hopeless. And the more you have to explain, the more hopeless it is. You might as well forget it. You have to give a long explanation of a deeper, meaningful concept, forget about it. If the person understands you with a wink or a nod or a hint or a sit, eh, then you have a chance. Silence. You could communicate. But if you need words, hopeless. Hopeless. But if you lived in the generation when humans spoke prophecy, can you imagine that? In the parishes we're reading now, we're coming to the story of the tower. The Iru Migdal. They built a tower. It wasn't bricks. Yeah, it was something very, very deep. They wanted to reach the root of creation. How were they able to do that? How were they able... What was their concept? Their concept was to build this edifice spiritually and wrest control of the creation unto themselves. Were they raving? How could you do such a thing? Human beings. Let's go up and fight against him. Him. Let's go do, make war with him and take over control of the world. Were they raving? They were virtually... How could human beings do that? Because they spoke the language of creation. They spoke the language of creation. They said words that were creative. They were dvori machadim. They spoke one language. Which language? The language. It doesn't mean Hebrew. Of course it was Hebrew. But it means the language that speaks creation. And that's why they were able to... How did Hashem defeat their purpose? Let us go down and mix up their language. Then they can't create anything. So Hashem came down on the tower and He mixed up their language. You know how they teach this to the children? Have you ever heard the Chayda teacher teaching this to the children? Children, these people were building a tower and they all spoke Hebrew. And they were getting along fine. So Hashem, in order to frustrate the work, he came down and he smote their language and they all started speaking different languages. This person was speaking Zulu, they were speaking Chinese. That's what, so he asked me for a hammer, he gave him a brick, he hit him over the head, the brick fell, the whole thing. They were not speaking Zulu and Chinese. Later, of course, it became Zulu and Chinese. It broke down into, into 70 root languages in the world. But that's not what it means originally. What it means originally was they were not just speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Lashon Kodesh, the holy language. Holy language means when I say something, you experience what I'm saying. You can't possibly misunderstand. You see it. You, it is there. It's not a word describing it. It is the thing. He came down and smoked the language to the extent that I say a word and you hear the word. You don't hear it in Zulu. You hear the word, but it means what you want it to mean, what you think I mean, or what you think I should mean. And that's how we can't build a spiritual edifice anymore. Language... Yeah, the language, the original Lashem Kodesh, was the language that was the tool of creation. When they had that tool, of course they could control the world. They could recreate the world. Of course they could. They were given that gift. And Hashem personally had to come down and break up language. And the way He broke it up was He took away its potential, its, its, its potency. He took away its prophetic. And there was only one man left who had that. I remember with Abraham and he founded a nation of prophets. That's another story. 
so what happened? The language was broken down. In the vestige of prophecy that remained among the Jewish people, and prophets, there were more than a million prophets in the Jewish people over a thousand years. They spoke a language that was the language of creation. That was never misunderstood, could not be misunderstood. What does it mean? Let's get this clear. During the generations of prophecy, you have to understand it doesn't only mean that there were prophets as individuals. For prophets to exist, the whole world has to be on that plane. What do you think it means that there were prophets once? You think in the telephone book under Nun, you know, you could look up the uh, individual and tell you what the weather would be tomorrow. It doesn't mean that. For prophets to exist, for people to have their heads in those clouds, the whole nation has to be on a level. The red line may be that above which certain individuals reach that potency. But everybody has to be on that level. They're the heads of a body. The whole world was on that level. Prophecy doesn't only mean there were individuals who knew the future. The world was incandescent with its, with its, with its meaning. Objects on earth spoke their message. You couldn't misunderstand them. Free will was entirely different. People weren't tempted by the doubts we have today. They didn't have any doubts. The, the doubts were on a completely different plane. They witnessed miracles. They saw miracles. They heard prophecy. Prophecy doesn't only mean that people spoke prophecy. It means every object on earth spoke its word. It was a word. It was an object and a word. When you took an apple, today you take an apple, never looks like an apple. In those days you took an apple and it was the divine Hashem that spoke its message. The apple said, I am a product of a divine energy. That's what I am. It glowed. It was luminescent with its meaning. And that's why they never made blessings. They never needed to make blessings because no one needed to identify a source. The source spoke. Every object on the earth sent its message. It was, its, it was a word and a word. It was an object and a word. N- nobody needed to make brachas because... But after the world went dark, when prophecy ended, then no one speaks that language anymore. No object on earth speaks its message. No object on earth is a word. It's just a dead object. Now you have to recreate the message. So now you've got to take an apple and say, you, you look like an apple. You are a product of a divine energy. Baruch HaTashem Hashem, you are the source of this apple. And because our whole world is dark, we have to put rock into everything. We don't see Hashem as the source of, of, of apples, and we don't even see Him as the source of mitzvahs. So we have to take the world and re-illuminate it. We have to take every object, using the bathroom. And we have to say, the fact that this thing works is a pillar, it's miraculous. And conceive for a moment what I'd look like if it didn't work. It's a big blessing having a rectum. You may not think so. But if you meet people who don't, like I can show you, they give anything to have yours. A big blessing. So you have to conceive what it would be like for a while without it. You have to make a bracha. That means you identify Hashem as the source of all this incredible complexity that works. And when you take an orange or an apple or banana or bread, you're identifying the source. Baruch Atah Hashem is Hashem, you, I acknowledge you are the source. It's an acknowledgement and it's a thanks. It's a sign of humility too. You guys say, I'm waiting lechem in It's Hashem, you bring forth bread from the earth. You know what the humility is? We don't know because today you go buy bread. But you know what bread means? You know what it means to have a loaf of bread? Do you know how much work is involved in a loaf of bread? Do you know, the, you know the, what taking the stones out of the field means? And then plowing the field. And then putting the seeds into the field. And then covering it up. And then watering it day after day after day for season after season. Till finally you have some wheat. And then you have to cut that. And you have to thresh it. And you have to winnow. And you have to eventually have enough flour to bake it. A loaf of bread of immense work over months. And what does the Jew do? You take those breads and you say, You, Hashem, bring out the food. If, if there's one moment in your life when you can think, I brought something forth from the earth, it's at the moment when you hold the loaf of bread in your hand. It's an immense amount of work of bringing it forth from the earth. We take the loaf of bread and we say, You bring the bread out of the earth. That's a tremendous statement of humanity, of acknowledgement of source, where you might well make a mistake. And therefore, the, the, the uttering of a brocha is not only a sign of humility and, and a statement of thanks, of admission that it's not me, but it's an identifying of source, that's all. And that's why they were not necessary before. And that's why everything now, you have to put brocha into everything. In the simple sense, you have to identify the source. And in the deep sense, you have to bring out its multiplicity. You have to bring out its tricephus meridui. You have to link the thing with its source. You have to link it with its source, not only identify the source. That's why brochas are essential. Identifying source 
is one of the most fundamental processes of human development. In the spiritual world, you know, there are many middas. Many middas. Overcoming jealousy, overcoming anger. There are all sorts of middas. Sensitivity to people's feelings. One of them is gratitude. What we call hakorosato, acknowledgement of where good comes from. And many sources indicate that it's the most important. The most important. Why? Why is gratitude, saying thank you to somebody who did something for you, why is it more important than not getting angry, not being jealous, or being sensitive? Why? Because in one fundamental sense, it has something that no other quality has. In Hebrew, when you say thank you, you see in English, you can't do this. In English, the word thanks means thanks. In Hebrew, the word modeh means to thank and to admit. What's the connection? When I thank you, I admit that it's you and not me. It's an admission. When I say thanks, I bend the knee in acquiescence. Yeah. There's an admission, there's a, there's a convention of saying thank you. But the meaning of the convention is, I admit that I did not do this, you did, I needed you. I was not yeah, infinitely powerful here. The exercise is tracing a thing to its source. When I was an infant, I thought the whole world was me. It was all here for me. As I become more mature, I understand that I need things outside of me. And I trace the thing one step at least to my mother, my father. I trace a source. A person who learns to trace a source will eventually discover Hashem. Because he'll eventually trace things to the unitary source of all sources. Gratitude is not just a good quality of character. It's a training in seeing spirituality. You say it wasn't me, it came from someplace else. Oh, it came from the earth. Where did that come from? Where did that potency come from? That capacity? You trace things. You learn to trace things inexorably all the way down until you get to a unitary source. A person who knows gratitude, yeah, a person who knows that, who trains himself to acknowledge source, to say thank you to acknowledge source, is a person who will trace himself back to his parents and then to their parents and then trace things back to the ultimate point of origin. When you make a bracha, you're, tracing, you're learning to trace things to their point of origin. You again identifying an ultimate source. Not just identifying it technically, academically, you identify in terms of bonding yourself into that source. And that's why you bring down the blessing from that source. That's why you bring down multiplicity. That's why there's an increase in what you are and what you have and what you deserve and what you can use when you link yourself into that source. And therefore, in summary, what we what we discovered this evening, what we learned, what we tried to study is the notion that the Torah begins with a base, it's the letter of Brocha. It's the letter, the ultimately female letter, which is one at the same time putting limitation into the world to give it the expression of blessing. The child is only this child now, no, none of the others that he could have been, with all these limited and finite specifics. And yet the blessing is that this is a spark that's become a flame that will go on to become a huge energy. That's what it is. It's that delicate balance where the one has been left behind, the Aleph is no longer visible. And it's split into two now. On the one hand, it's come down from its infinity of oneness into a world of finite parts and differentiation and bits and pieces and breakdown and fracture. On the other hand, it's multiplied. It's not one anymore, it's two. That paradox is where Brock is located. And the talent here is to be able to identify that, to see the specific source, to take it all the way back, all the way back to its unitary source, to see where the base comes out of the olive. That pele, that is the Aleph, that miracle, that mystery, which is one that can be more than one, that can be a unitary source and give specifics and differentiated entities. And sp- That's the gross. And therefore, when you make a bracha, it's not simply a convention. Not simply a convention. It's a mitzvah in its own right. And it's the work that we need to, yeah, we need to do this work of learning to identify. So when the world is dark and an apple tempts you, think that it's an apple. It's a result of a few million years of things bumping, to, bumping into each other in the, in, the, in, the, in the jungle. You take this apple in your hand and you say, you are Shem of the source of this thing. Yes. You identify the source and you put back into this object in the world just some of the original illumination that it once had.